And now I'm joined by Dr. Robert Oscar Lopez. He's a professor at Scarborough College, and he's a great commentator on all things LGBT and Christian and the relationship between those two things. Um, first of all, thank you very much for joining me, Bobby. Thank you very much for having me on, Steve. So I had an amazing, mind-blowing moment this week because all of the Supreme Court cases that have been coming through are worth looking at, but one of them in particular, the one on NIFLA, which was the Supreme Court ruling that it is not constitutional to compel pro-life organizations to promote abortion. We're thinking of, like, you know, of course, women's health clinics. Many of our viewers are probably familiar with this. Mm -hmm. But what they did is they essentially they said there isn't this special kind of professional speech that you can compel the content of for medical practitioners at women's health clinics. If they're pro-life health clinic, they don't they can't be forced to promote the alternative view, the the pro-abortion view or recommend pro you know abortion clinics to their to their pregnant clients. Correct. So the reason why I wanted to have you on is because some people have pointed out and in fact where I read this was Mother Jones, which is a far, you know, a pretty far left publication. They said, "Well, I wonder what will happen if they if people start trying to apply this ruling to medical professionals who want to help people with same-sex attraction in any way other than the pro LGBT way." And that's your specialty. So I wondered what your thoughts might be on this. Well, from what I can gather about the issues that were at stake with the NIFLA case, it seems like it would transfer very easily. On the issue of same-sex attraction and these laws that have been passed now in 12 states, many more coming down the pike, which right. seek to prevent people from leaving the gay scene. That's basically what these laws are purposed to do. They penalize those who would offer assistance to people who want to get out of the networks of homosexuals who have sex with each other. I think that it was inevitable that this latest phase of gay activism, which tries to force everybody to state that people are happier if they're in the gay scene, no matter what their backstory is, and that everybody right. is incapable of changing from homosexuality to heterosexuality, that whole movement by the LGBT movement was destined to crash on the rocks at some point because it is unfounded in terms of its assumptions. The research really does not back them up. They prop it up with a lot of very suspect research and they ignore important research like the work done by Paul McHugh at Johns Hopkins University. So mm -hmm. it would seem as though uh, the, the NIFLA case, it, it's not necessarily that this case is going to be the key to overturning all the bans on ex-gay therapy. I just think that it is one case that really gives us the opportunity to see why the ex-gay therapy bans are destined to fall apart. They're just so at odds with reality. Well, they're destined to fall apart, certainly in an originalist, under an originalist Supreme Court, in a way. Like, it's funny to me, though, that this is also a reminder that, as Christians, I think that it's best for us to approach issues with the idea that actually, strangely enough, uh, freedom tends to favor the truth in a way. Right, absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things that is so bad about the bans on ex-gay therapy is that there was a great deal of uh, coverage and of attention paid to the laws in Russia that were banning people from promoting homosexuality to young people. But the bans on ex-gay therapy are actually much worse because, especially the one that just came through in California, they now uh, cover all ages. They cover whether people want to leave the gay community or they don't. They, they uh, force people to stay in the gay community even if they got there through abuse or through desperation or through exploitation or pressure or bullying. So it, these the bans on ex-gay therapy are very bad. Uh, I would put them on the same plane as laws that are trying to compel clinics to send women to abortion. And I, I definitely think that what we can gather from the NIFLA case is that the Supreme Court, particularly with Anthony Kennedy gone, will be ripe for there to be some major decisions that will come down the pike, hopefully, and will get rid of a lot of these bans on ex-gay therapy because they are worse than the bans in Russia on propagandizing to minors. These are laws all across the country which are basically forcing people to tell young uh, Americans that they have some code inside of their bloodstream that predestines them, almost in a, a quasi-religious sense, to be involved in a certain kind of sexual activity, even though many of them don't enjoy the sex, 
don't want to be involved in that and have belief systems that are at odds with it. Right. Now, one last question, because this is really your specialty in a lot of ways, and you've commented on this for years. I'm worried now because I am going to be a parent. I am a parent, which I'm pretty excited about. Congratulations. And a lot of, yes, thank you. Yeah. But and a lot of people who have children, what I worry about is not so much like, okay, I can imagine if I were in the condition, if I were in a situation where I'm 18 years old, so technically I kind of say, well, you know, I can make my own decisions. And if I talk to a doctor who's bound by law to sort of encourage any same-sex attraction I might have, uh, that's kind of worrisome. But what worries me in a way more is parents who have kids who are minors talking to doctors, and they have a set of beliefs, and whenever they take their kid to the doctor, it's like taking their kid to a public school. You know what I mean? It becomes ideology rather than medicine. How expansive is that problem, do you think? Is that really, am I being paranoid? No, you're not being paranoid. We have to look at everything in context, and this is where I have faulted sometimes our side. I have faulted the conservative pro-family movement because very Mm -hmm. often they approach things with a very naive perspective. The, The question when isolated about whether or not it's fair to tell young people that they might have the ability to get out of homosexual behavior. That's weighty enough, but when we place it in context with all of the propaganda being forced on children in schools because of the expansive efforts to to bring LGBT curriculum to very young children, all of the propaganda that's being forced on them through the public libraries and in the media and through all of these medical professions, you have many different instances where people are encouraged pressured to experiment with homosexuality, perhaps to respond with arousal if an older predator initiates them into homosexuality, and then to conclude from that experience, which they did not really enter out of their own native interest, right, that Mm -hmm. they will be compelled to conclude from that, that they are gay, that they will never be anything but gay, and that they have to continue to make themselves available to other people who are in the gay community. So as a parent, you have to worry about this because you could possibly fight the battle with one doctor or one teacher, but you can't fight with the whole culture. You need to form a movement, and we need uh, organized resistance to this. I do think that the conservative pro-family movement needs to shift its resources. We don't have the kind of money that the pro-gay movement does, and I feel that we're putting too much of our money in protecting these esoteric religious liberty cases, like uh, people who don't want to do service for a same-sex wedding. I think that there is importance in some of the issues that are raised there, but that pales in importance uh, when you think about protecting our children from being manipulated and psychologically pressured into this kind of destructive behavior and then being forbidden from getting out of it. I mean, it's... Right, it's so constrictive. It's funny, the way they treat homosexual sex is more constrictive than any any heterosexual would treat their own sexuality. It's like, you have to be locked into this, and it it is, I'm sorry to say, but I know from your own reports and so forth, uh, and from others, it would be a lot less scary if homosexuality and the LGBT movement itself was extremely monogamous but it's not right. that's not the scene it's chaos right it's 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 not a healthy option for people and we hear all these cases of people who become suicidal when mm. they are encouraged to get out of homosexuality but the problem is that people get very suicidal when they're in the gay scene and they're stuck and they can't leave because it's claustrophobic it's a smaller part of the population and so within any one particular community once you've had a couple different sexual encounters you soon find yourself constantly being in this social network where you have all this bad tawdry history with a lot of people around you and the sex acts themselves are unsatisfying, in many cases unsanitary and unhealthy. The risk of disease is very high and the chance of getting into a healthy monogamous relationship and being able to adopt children is very low. So mm. it, it just on it's a- not it's not it's not the picture you see in the campaign ads. Right. And so I think definitely there are many instances where the most professional and ethical thing to advise a young person would be not to foster their fantasies about same-sex activity, not to experiment with it, or if they have experimented in it, to really orient themselves towards cultivating a heterosexual uh, mentality you know, going forward. And uh, unfortunately, these laws are trying to block people from doing that. But I think that the Supreme Court, particularly with Anthony Kennedy gone, because he in particular wrote a lot of court decisions that just showed a misguided, distorted view of human sexuality. His decision in the Obergefell case, for instance, was 
was quite poor. So I think with him gone, uh, hopefully the Supreme Court will come to its senses and will look at a lot of these bans on speech that are coming from the LGBT movement with the same kind of scrutiny and the same constitutional rigor that they applied to the case of NIFLA. Amen. Well, thank you for the superb analysis. Bobby Lopez, where can our viewers find you and your work? Well, right now I've really shifted. In response to the California law, I have rebranded my online content. Now I'm just providing advice to men who want to get out of the gay scene and want to start dating women. And that website is englishmanif.blogspot.com. That's englishmanif.blogspot.com. And that if is uh, iota foxtrot. All right. Well, thank you again, Bobby. I look forward to having you on again soon. Thank you. 